I'll tell you what, uh, I was pleasantly surprised in the worship service when, when Ben introduced the four new interns this morning. I didn't know that was coming. Uh, I don't know if you've had an opportunity over this past year to get to know the other four interns that we have. Uh, they're all wonderful people. And I'm, boy, I'm so excited this thing's taken off. You know, our, our plan uh, is to train those young people and then in a year or two send them out to plant a couple of churches. Yeah. And we don't know if they're going to be here in Fort Worth or in China. We don't have any idea. We're going to pray about that. But, but they're, those all those young people that you saw this morning and our other, they're, they're circulating through our church, all of it. They're, they're being exposed to everything from the nursery to the senior departments to uh, the church office and the county, you name it. Uh, they're letting them see all of what being uh, a church leader is, and uh, it's going to be it's going to be fabulous. I, I tell you, I can't wait. Well, last week uh, we were in Daniel chapter nine uh, and did verses one through twenty, just about verse twenty is about as far as I got. This is, uh, as I said, remember. Let me refresh your memory a little bit. Daniel 9 is not the prophecies and the visions and the stories like the first eight chapters have been. It's a break in chapter 9 and when Daniel uh, finds himself reading the book of Jeremiah, the same book of Jeremiah you've got in your Bible. And in there, you know, he's reading and he sees where God says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to scatter my people Israel to a foreign land, to Babylon, for 70 years. Punishment. And then, you know, he adds it up, and he looks, and he goes, it's up. The 70 years is up, and he began to pray for God to keep his promise to take the children of Israel from Babylon back over to Israel, to their homeland. And so we've got this wonderful prayer in the first part of Daniel chapter 9. Matter of fact, I'll reemphasize this one more time. Uh, it's a prayer that you, if you want to, you might make a project of this in your own personal prayer life. Open that up in your Bible and pray it to the Lord, just as a guide, a prayer guide for you, because it teaches you all kinds of ways that you, uh, being here, can pray for your church and can pray for your nation. And uh, it's, it's a template, it's a guide. So, now, we got to about verse 20 last week, Daniel had prayed this prayer, and he says in verse 20, while he was speaking, praying, and confessing his sin and the sin of his people, Israel, and presenting his supplications before the Lord, my God, for the holy mountain of my God. So there he is, picture him in your mind's eye. Uh, he is in his rooms, he's praying, Probably got the book of Jeremiah open in his lap, reading about the promises of God and everything. So he's he's right in the midst of it. Now I want you to I want to call out a little bit of uh, detail to you before we go on to the next verse. While he was praying, I want you to notice what he was praying for. It's something very interesting uh, to all those of you that are conversing with your scriptures, in particular the Old Testament prophecies. Uh, and the New Testament. When he talks about he's praying before the holy mountain of his God, do you know what that is? Jerusalem. It's Jerusalem and it's a specific mountain there. It's what we call today in the modern, modern world the Temple Mount. Uh, you, you've all heard, I know, that that's where the Dome of the Rock is for the Islam religion right now. It's the place that prophecy experts say someday the temple of the Jews is going to be rebuilt on that mountain. Uh, it's called Mount Moriah in the Old Testament. I want to give you just a brief little background on this mountain that he's praying towards. Mount Moriah is the place that God told Abraham to take his son, his only son, and prepare an offering of his son on the mountain of which God would show him. That's, that's Mount Moriah. That's the Temple Mount. We know that story. Mount Moriah, later on in Jewish history, that's the place that King David came along 
and he purchased that mountain. Uh, at the time, it was called uh, the threshing floor of Old Man. Isn't that interesting? You know what threshing is, right? We've got some wheat farmers in here somewhere, don't we? I thought we did. Yeah. Yeah. Up there on Mount Moriah, on the Temple Mount, <clears throat> excuse me, Mount Old Man evidently was threshing his wheat. David bought that as a place for what? To build Solomon's Temple. To build the Temple. The first Temple. The Temple. All right. Well, as it turns out, and I didn't bring my, my geology uh, maps and layouts and everything with me this morning. I've got them at home. Mount Moriah, the Temple Mount, I know you've seen pictures of it. Mount Moriah is on a ridge. And that ridge runs just a little bit south and west from the Temple Mount up there. And just a little ways, just about a mile and a half, two miles, is where you come to a place of Mount Moriah's ridge line that is called Calvary. Yeah. It's the place where Jesus was crucified. Golgotha, if you will. It's the place where Jesus was offered up for our sin. So verse 21, yeah, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached out to me about the time of the evening offering. A couple of things. Uh, word of God is holy, it's pure, it's everlasting. And yet I find so much in it that, that just, uh, it just almost tickles me. Where's heaven? Where is it? How far away is it? Can anybody tell me? Uh, we don't know, do we? But do you notice in verse 21 that the man was praying? He was praying for an answer to the 70 years. And look what it says while he was praying. This man, Gabriel, we know that's an angel, it's an archangel, was sent from heaven, where, where that is, I don't know exactly, but they told him to fly swiftly yeah. to get there. You know there's people out there, I, I, don't, I don't hold to it, there's people out there that say, heaven's not a place, it's a dimension, you know, it's, it's some kind of fourth dimension. I don't, I don't buy that, because when I read my Bible, it seems like it's a place. Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Amen. And here, if God had to tell Gabriel, get up and fly to Baghdad to Daniel and answer his prayer, that tells me that heaven is out there somewhere yonder, and Baghdad is over there, and the Archangel Gabriel had to fly to get there. Space and time. Wouldn't you like to be praying a prayer sometime and the Archangel Gabriel shows up? I mean, seriously. Seriously. I mean, do we, do we even think about things like that when we pray? I wonder what it would be like if your spiritual eyes were opened up this morning. Right here. Right here in the great room at Travis Avenue Baptist Church. Are there some angels watching? Amen. I wouldn't be surprised. I can't tell you for sure. But here... The Archangel Gabriel appears. Now you know, you know Gabriel. Gabriel the Archangel. He's the one that showed up to Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist in the temple when he was told that his wife was going to have a son and he'd be a prophet. Gabriel, he's the one that showed up to Mary, the mother of Jesus, and told him what was getting ready to happen. Holy Spirit will overshadow you, and so on and so forth. Well, here he is, 500 years before those two examples. The archangel is sent by God to talk to Daniel, the prophet, about the vision that he had seen previously. Amen. And he said in verse 22, I've, I've come forth to give you skill to understand it. Uh, file that away, if you will. When you pray, one of the results or answers to prayer is that God gives us understanding and knowledge, insight, 
into his will. Don't think of prayer so much as you needing to convince God to change his mind about something that you want. So much as an opportunity for you to enter through the spirit world in communication with our Heavenly Father and allow him to speak to you about what he's doing in your life, to give you information and insight that uh, you need. As Gabriel calls it in verse 22, he says, Daniel, I want to give you skill. Isn't that interesting? He wants to answer his prayers in a way that Daniel has spiritual skill to interpret the word of God to his people. But 70 years are up, folks, and we're fixing to go home and go back to Israel. Verse 23 is very interesting. Gabriel says, at the beginning of your supplications, your prayers, at the very beginning of your prayers, the command went out. And I've come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved, therefore consider the matter and understand the vision. Uh, friends, that's, if you will, without trying to be flippant, that is a, it, it's an opening for us to see into the throne room of God to see what it's like in heaven. And clearly what we can discern from this is this, that there are angels attending upon God there, that God is able to speak and command and communicate to those angels. Furthermore, that God cares intimately about what we're going through here in this world. Yeah. When he says in verse 23, when you started to pray, God the Father spoke to me, the angel, and sent me to talk to you, to answer your prayers. Now, friends, that'll do something for you. When you say your prayers tonight, consider that. Don't just fall into a rote routine of voicing your petitions and then close your eyes and go to sleep. No. Now there's a whole lot more involved. There's a God in heaven. He's a God that cares. He has angels under his authority. And he doesn't mind sending angels to minister to his servants here in this world. And that's what verse 23 teaches us. As I'm switching over to another lesson here, I want to point out to you the last thing about verse 23 is something I've I've always uh, been moved by, and that is that Daniel is the only prophet that Jesus ever called beloved. And he does it three times in the book of Daniel, and he does it in the synoptic gospels that we have today. Now, he loves everybody, and I'm not saying he didn't love Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and all the rest. More than we know. But we need, to, we need to seriously consider what does that mean when God singles out one man, one man that's a prophet, and calls him beloved. What is it about that man that was beloved? What was it that he said that he prophesied that was special to the Lord? And I want to remind you what that is. Daniel is the prophet of the last days. Mm -hmm. He's the prophet of the great tribulation. He's the prophet of the second coming of Christ, the millennium, heaven, all of it is found in no clearer place in the Old Testament than in the book of Daniel, uh, God's things, and I think that's why he's called a lover. Now, we're going we're gonna to jump off a little bit into Daniel 9.24 here. I'm not going to get through with it this morning, because uh, as I said last week, this is the deep water mark of Bible prophecy. Daniel 9, 24 through 27. And I'm going to not hurry through. Uh, this is the bedrock of all Old Testament and New Testament prophecy. This is uh, several little verses that predict to the day, the day that Jesus would present himself to be king in Jerusalem that he would be crucified, that he would rise again. We're going to study that in depth here in these passages. Um, 
If you got your Bible or you're looking at your handout there, look at verse 24, where the Word of God says, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. Now I'm going to stop right there. Uh, 70 weeks. Now we're going to explain what that means in just a minute. It's probably not what you think. But it is interpreted for us, so we're going to be okay. No confusion. The point I want to make is, pay attention to verse 24, when Gabriel the archangel says, this prophecy that I'm fixing to interpret for you is for who? It's for your people. Daniel. Who are the people of Daniel? That would be Israel, the Jewish people, correct? And what would be the holy city of Daniel? Jerusalem. That's the city where God built his temple. It's the place where his dwelling place is among men. It's the place that his uh, word calls it, the apple of his eye. Now, why am I saying all this about the Jews and about Jerusalem? Why am I doing that? Well, it's because I know you guys are, are readers and studiers and you watch things on TV and movies and such. There are people that interpret this 180 degrees differently than I'm going to interpret it for you. And I, I, I don't want you to believe it because I say it. I want you to believe it for yourself. I want you to look at the scriptures as we go through these verses and you check me if I'm wrong. You prove me if I'm wrong. But there are people out there today that teach that they've reinterpreted this and say, well, you know what, God? God got mad at the Jews and he doesn't care about them anymore and so he's replaced the Jews with the church. It's out there. Lots of books, lots of movies, lots of professors. They spiritualize it. They allegorize it. They symbolize it. But I want to tell you something. And this is where I, I challenge you to check it. The Word of God is to be interpreted in a historical, grammatical, clear sense of the Scripture. If the Word of God says it, God means it, that's the way I believe. I don't need some smart person telling me what it's a symbol for. If it says God's holy city, I believe it's Jerusalem because the Word of God 800 times in the Old Testament calls Jerusalem the holy city. I don't believe it's a symbol for the church. I don't believe it's some kind of allegory about some who knows what that's going to happen out there in the future. I, I, don't, I don't interpret the Bible that way. And I don't think any of us are to interpret the Bible that way. So we're going to look at these four verses probably for two or three weeks because I want to go real slow and, and I want you to Come with me, and I want you to, you know, challenge me. If you think I've said something wrong, I want to hear it. But I, I want to ask you to listen to me and see if it's not consistent with what you read and the way you interpret the Holy Bible, the Word of God. Now, got that rabbit behind me. Next, next Sunday's Palm Sunday, and the Sunday after that's Easter. We're going to pull off Daniel for two weeks, and I'm going to do a lesson from the scriptures next week uh, on the crucifixion, Palm Sunday, and then the uh, next Sunday I'm going to do a Bible study on the resurrection, right? So we need to keep in tune with the rest of our church. And then after that, we'll get back uh, to looking at uh, Daniel chapter 9. All right. So I put some information in your handout. Uh, you don't have to read it right now, but I'd encourage you to read it uh, as, you know, the day goes on, the week goes on. I want to make a point. Verse 24 says, 70 weeks are determined. These are weeks of years, and I believe in your handout I give you an explanation for that. It's kind of foreign to us. We don't talk like that, but the Jews did. And the Bible does. It's not uncommon in the Bible for there to be weeks of 
weeks of days, weeks of months, and even weeks of years in the scriptures. This is one that is weeks of years. So uh, one of these is seven years. Now, we're going to study and look at this like this. Weeks, the word weeks, if you look, it's found six times in Daniel 9, 24 through 27. So that tells you something. That tells you it's important that you understand what it means. God's emphasizing something. It is a word that means sevens of years, and it comes right out of the law of Moses. This is not Daniel making something up. This comes right out of Leviticus 25. It's my favorite chapter in the books of Moses, Leviticus 25. It's the year of Jubilee. Amen. They had some strange ideas back then. God told them, he said, you, you farmers, he said, I want you to farm the land uh, for six years, and I'm gonna bless you and give you produce from your farming, but the seventh year, I want you to stay in the house. Yeah. I don't want you to plant, I don't want you to harvest, and I promise you in those six years, I will bless you enough to carry you through the seventh year of Sabbath rest. All right? So that's Leviticus 25. You can read it yourself, the year of Jubilee. That is the, the week, that is the week of years that was established back in Leviticus 25. Well, it just so happens that God, when he sent Gabriel here to Daniel, he said, we're going to do another weeks of years. And I'm going to tell you how long it's going to be, Daniel, until the Messiah comes and proclaims himself to be the king. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. 500 years later, Christ would come. When he says your people, we've established it's the Jews. When he says it's your city, we've established that it's Jerusalem. But I want you to look at your verse 24 with me again. Let me read this quickly. There are six infinitives there to be given next. He's saying there's going to be 70 weeks of years that are determined, established, laid down for the Jewish people, Jerusalem, and here's what I'm going to do in that 70 weeks of years. Here's what I'm going to do, God says. I'm going to finish transgression. I'm going to make an end of sin. I'm going to make reconciliation for iniquity. I'm going to bring in everlasting righteousness. I'm going to seal up all visions and prophecies. And I'm going to anoint the most holy. Amen. Now, that was a lot. And don't be intimidated because we're going to take, as I said, after Easter, probably two weeks, maybe three, to go through those six infinitives, all right? We're not going to rush through this. I just want to say something to you. I just want to give you a little check. Would you say that there's been an end of sins in this world we live in? Would you say that all iniquities have been reconciled among people and among God in this world we live in? Have we all experienced everlasting righteousness this morning? These things haven't happened yet. Now three of them, the first three, I want to give you a clue, they happened at the cross. Amen. Messiah, Jesus, crucified on the cross, paid for sin, our substitute. Those three were dealt with at the cross. Look at the last three. The first three are the first coming. The next three are the second coming. They haven't happened yet. There's not righteousness among people. Visions and prophecies are still in effect. We are still, look at us right here this morning, standing right here and we're studying what? Prophecy. It's still part of our lives because it hasn't been fulfilled yet, but it's going to be. 
It's going to be sealed up. And then to anoint the most holy. In the Hebrew language, that most holy, you know what it says? It's not the most holy. It's the holy of holies. You know what that is? The holy of holies? You do, don't you? There's going to be another temple built. <coughs> another temple's going to be built on Mount Moriah. And the Antichrist is going to come and proclaim himself to be God in that temple. And then our Lord Jesus Christ is going to come at the second coming to destroy him with the word of his mouth. And he's going to anoint the Holy of Holies again to cleanse him, make him pure. Amen. So, Daniel 9, 24 through 27 are just a, a precursor. Now, allow me, if, if I may, uh, I love history, and I hope you do too. I hope that y'all are intrigued by human history. I'd like to read it. I know many folks do. Uh, I want to call your attention to a gentleman by the name of Sir Robert Anderson. Sir Robert Anderson. He was a, an English lord in the early 1800s. He was the first inspector general of Scotland Yard. He worked on the case of Jack the Ripper. Yeah. Well, it turns out Sir Robert happened to be a very devout Christian man, a diligent student of the Word of God. And for, I don't know, let's see, about 1,500 years of church history, the church got off track. From about 300 AD of Augustine up until the late 1800s, the church got off into an interpretation of prophecy called Amillennial, which says this, that all these prophecies, these are just symbols, they're allegories. They're not real, they're not literal, and God doesn't want the Jews anymore, he's brought the church into the world and all the promises to the Jews, he's picked up and put on to the church. And that's all wrong. It's wrong. God's not through with his people. His promises to them were everlasting. Yes, sir. And as we study Daniel 24 through 27, you're going to see what I'm talking about. But this the, here's what I was going to say about Sir Robert Anderson. This policeman got his book of Daniel out and began to study the Hebrew language. And he wrote a little book, The Coming Prince. Now, you can get it free on the internet. Just, just Google Sir Robert Anderson, The Coming Prince. It's a, it's a small book. Maybe some of you have read it. It's probably only about 100 pages. And he correctly recaptures and interprets Daniel to show that what Gabriel's saying to us this morning in these four little verses predicts to the day 173, 173,000 420 days before the fact that Jesus Christ will proclaim himself to be king in Jerusalem. And it's right here in our little book. And we're going to delve into that in depth in the next few weeks as we get into that. So let me, let me quickly, those six little statements, let me just quickly give you a, a sentence or two about what each one means. The first one is... Seventy weeks are determined in order to finish the, tr the transgression. That is transgression with the definite article, the, capital T, the big transgression, which is what? That is the Jewish people's rejection of Messiah. He's going to finish it. To make an end of sin, number two. Well, this is clear. Where was sin finally dealt with? Well, certainly not in Daniel's time. So this is looking out in the future somewhere. Where was sin dealt with to make an end of sin? That was, that was the cross of Jesus Christ. It was the place by the wonder of God. And don't, don't know if I, I understand it completely, but I do know that it's true that the sin that you have committed in your life God was able to transfer that upon the shoulders of Jesus Christ 
in a very real and personal way, and he paid for your sins and satisfied the wrath of God that was against you. And he did it for you. Yeah. The one for the many, right? Yeah. To make an end of sin to all those that will trust in him as their Lord and Savior and Messiah. Number three, to make atonement for iniquity. Once again, the cross. Hosea says, I will go away and return to my place until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face in their afflictions. Hosea 5.15. That verse from Hosea means, <laughs> and it's another prophecy, but it means this. Jesus came. He lived among us. He ministered to us. But most importantly, he came and he died for us and our sin. The Jewish people in large part rejected that. They rejected him as their Messiah. Matter of fact, uh, most of them today, the ones that are religious, are they're looking for the Messiah to come. All right? They're still looking for him to come. He's already come. Yeah. They're still looking for somebody else. To make an atonement for iniquity is the day when the Jewish people will finally call upon the name of the Lord. And as, what is it, Romans 11, 12, and 13, Paul teaches us, there's coming a day when all the Jewish people will be saved. Next is to bring in everlasting righteousness. Here's the truth. You already know it. You can't make yourself righteous. You can't do it. You might have the best intentions in the world, but I guarantee you within 30 minutes to an hour, you're going to fail Amen. You're going to sin. That thought's going to come into your mind. The deed's going to come to your hands. You're going to sin. You can't bring in everlasting righteousness by yourself. The idea that the word bring is here is important because what it means is you're going to be saved. You were saved. You have been saved because Jesus Christ brought righteousness to this world when he died on the cross for us and allowed us to be clothed with his righteousness. It was something I didn't do and you didn't do, but it was brought to you. And when you talk about the day of your salvation, what you're talking about is the day that Jesus Christ gave you something that you did not have, that you did not earn, you did not deserve it, he brought righteousness to you. The next infinity is to seal up vision and prophecy. And I've already talked about this. You know, there's coming a day when Jesus Christ will be here again. He will rule from his throne of David in Jerusalem. He will govern the world. He will end the great tribulation. He will rule over our world through, through the thousand year millennium. And then when the new Jerusalem comes, he'll be our king and our messiah and ruler then too. Friends, when he's standing here with us, we're not going to need prophecy anymore. We're not, we're not going to need any visions. Our faith is going to turn to sight. Yeah. Seal up vision and prophecy. And as I said earlier, the last one is to anoint the most holy place. You know, this is something that it boggles most Christians' minds. But there's going to come another temple on Mount Moriah. And this is where a lot of people chicken out, frankly. They go, oh, he can't do that. The Muslims have the dumb on the rock there. They, he can't do that. That's crazy. Friends, it's not crazy. We don't have private information to know how the Lord is going to do it. I don't know. There's some people say that the dumb on the rock is going to be destroyed. I don't know. There's other people over there in Israel right now at the Temple Institute. They say... That's not the place where the Dome of the Rock is. It's over here. We can build it right now, today, and not bother anybody. 
I don't know what the answer is. All I know is my Jesus in Matthew 24 and Mark 13 said, when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the temple, flee. So if that's what he said, that means the temple is going to be rebuilt again someday, somehow, somewhere. I don't know. Yeah. Any of it. But that's what this one is. To anoint the most holy place means there's going to be a temple. There's going to be a holy Savior enthroned in that temple in the Holy of Holies. And it's going to be heaven. Amen. It's going to be heaven on earth for all of us. Well, I think we probably better pull it in right about here. Uh, I would encourage you this week in your private Bible reading times, look at John 19 uh, in preparation for our study next week about Palm Sunday. And uh, we're going to talk about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ <laughs> this week. And the week after that, about the resurrection. Heavenly Father, we pray this morning. We pray, Lord, feeling like uh, in some small way we are just like Daniel. That he was praying to you. And that you heard him. That you cared. You sent Gabriel. Lord, to help Daniel understand. Heavenly Father, we pray now to ask you that we might, too, be recipients of your grace, insight, that we might have skill, wisdom, and knowledge, Lord, about you, about your ways, about your nature. That we might understand your word, Heavenly Father, would you illumine us and give us Give us insight, Father, of what it means. We pray and ask you, Heavenly Father, give us faith to believe what we read. We ask that you forgive those among us, Lord, that explain away your word, spiritualize it, symbolize it, and so on. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus, we pray that you reign over us. Reign in us, Lord. We pray. Lord Jesus, that you come soon. Amen. Amen.